Hi, it's Mike Murphy with IBM Research, and I'm here with Johanna Schmuda, and today we're going to talk about the new heliophysics model from IBM Research. I believe it's called Surya. Surya? Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Surya, which is Sanskrit and, you know, stands for the sun, essentially, and it follows in the footsteps of, you know, our previous models, you know, periphery Earth observation and periphery weather and climate, which are also named based on Sanskrit. So why do we need a model for the sun? Well, there is a whole bunch of different reasons you know, can think about. Obviously, let's maybe not start talking about the sun itself, but let's start talking about like, you know, AI foundation models for science. Now, so there's one big thing you can say where you say you train AI models, which um, focus on different, you know, scientific setups, trying to have scientific accuracy, etc. You know, we've seen this is possible in weather, in Earth observation, but it's obviously not for every other physical domain the same clear that this works and how it works. Lots of detail to sort out, no? So this is one question, just mm -hmm. science and AI for science in general, mm -hmm. you know? The second part obviously is like more relevant why this specific domain, mm -hmm. that's the actual question, or why actually it's sun, no? And A, it's a fascinating and very complex system. But then talking applications, obviously, you know, we think again about, you know, space exploration, where obviously, you know, eventually like, you know, astronauts are, you know, maybe impacted by solar flares, solar storms, etc. you know? But then also beyond of this, there's the question of um, the sun influencing the Earth, mm -hmm. satellites, you know, or eventually even also um, precision electronics on Earth. It's really interesting when you are approaching a problem like this, primarily from the source of we have lots of data that we want to make sense of. How much of the of the building of a model like this is almost like trial and error, trying to figure out the right approach? So actually, it's really interesting. Um, you know, we, I said earlier we. It's not exactly the first time we've done this. No, it's the first time we've done this for heliophysics, no, but we built, especially with our collaborators at NASA, mm -hmm. a bunch of models, and there's almost like a process established by now. And um, one of the things to sort of figure out initially is what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. It's really important because, you know, especially when you come to something for new and it's for the first time, definitely for the first time for you, you know, but maybe also, you know, in, in this case, arguably within this domain as well, there's so many things you could be doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, we could be doing this and this and this application, this application. Then you build this like five-headed monster, which is totally impossible to do, you know, which is like sort of going to do everything and nothing at the same time. So the first step is like deciding all the things you're not going to do, mm -hmm. you know, and this means from temporal scale, spatial resolution. So in this case, for example, just to throw some things out there, you know, sure, we said the model is going to go into the future, but maybe how far, mm -hmm. you know? Or another question is, you know, this particular data, you know, it comes at, you know, 4,000 by 4,000 pixel resolution, mm -hmm. which typically for AI vision models is pretty massive. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't typically work at this scale. So you can say, like, maybe you should work at coarser scales, finer scales, etc. Then there's a question, should I work at the probabilistic or deterministic model? And so you have to make lots of decisions. And obviously, you try to sort of circle this in by talk a lot to the domain experts, mm -hmm. you know, seeing what makes sense, you know, are the, you know. For the probabilistic question, are we expecting probabilistic dynamics? Does it have to be deterministic, et cetera? Yeah. You know, resolution, like what's the minimal resolution acceptable to the main experts? You know, can we just like cross grain the data heavily and are you guys only fine with this? You know, like how much in the future is it realistic to go? And that way sort of, you have like a canvas, you sort of you calibrate your ambition a bit, no? And once you have this, it sort of defines an AI problem. And then you iterate over this a bit, no? So I'm trying to say, you establish sort of really a process to circle in on this domain, no? Mm -hmm. And this is a bit different if you come somewhere where lots of, you know, pre or prior models exist, you're much more looking at the existing prior models, the benchmark problems, the performance, and trying to see what can you like slightly improve here. You know, here it's much more, it's much more open canvas. Again, with the caveat that lots of AI work exists as a model foundation model work, you know. So what's, what makes this a difficult task that's worth uh, diving into? What about those, those solar events is, is, being unpacked by this model. So uh, Surya is actually trained on data from uh, SDO, okay? That's the Solar Dynamics Observatory, so you know, satellite by NASA. But um, there's obviously a whole bunch of other satellites that could have been used for this. No, SDO is the most advanced platform. Now, this is fully trained in observational data, you know, which means the model sees the sun as SDO sees the sun, mm -hmm. which means you see the sun actually only from one side, okay? So there's an assumption in there that you say, can you understand the dynamics of a physical system and say something useful by seeing it only in one specific way, mm. you know? And obviously a big question is even in this domain, can you, you know, answer these questions purely by learning from data, mm. you know? Conventionally, if you don't use AI methods, you say, hey, there's some sort of physics modeling has to go in, some experience and fundamental laws, you know? In this case, this is a purely like data-driven model, you know, which is trained on purely observational data, which means, you know, you don't see half the sun, mm. you know? Everything that like happens like, you know, on the far side of the sun, 
the model would not know about, no? So there already it's not clear whether you can do something productive, you know? On top of it, obviously, you know, it's the very specific question of the dynamics of the sun, the physics involved, etc. Can the model infer this just from data or not to then be, you know, a successful predictive model? It seems like an interesting scientific challenge as well as an AI challenge, because I feel like on the one hand, you've got the fact, as you say, you can't see what is effectively the dark side of the sun, if there is such a thing. Um, and then you've got the problem of, I, I know um, with with the past uh, models uh, your team's worked on, it's they've been trained by um, masking parts of images or hiding parts of what the data would be, um, and then reinforcing when they were right at, at predicting what that should be. I believe you did something like that with, with Syria, and I guess that's also a similar challenge to the fact you can't see half of the thing you're trying to look at. So let me, let me phrase it slightly differently. One of the interesting questions when you like try to apply foundation models to science is the following. No? So in the foundation model paradigm, you generally say, I train the model on a pretext task, not in a specific problem. Train it sort of in a task agnostic way or in this pretext way, and then use it for something useful. Mm -hmm. But this means, what's the pretext task? You know, especially when you come to like a domain in the sense of, you know, heliophysics for the first time, mm -hmm. questions like where to start. And there's different things you can do. So in computer vision, a very standard thing is, you know, what's called masking, mm -hmm. which is also inspired by what happens in language models. You basically remove parts of an image, let the model reconstruct it. That's one thing one could have done here, mm -hmm. you know? But then this is not just an image problem. This is also a temporal problem. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you could also say, like, maybe I do some sort of temporal prediction, you know? And indeed, if you forget for a second about computer vision, in another domain where, you know, there's been lots of success and development recently, you know, weather in particular, people tend to address this more as a forecasting problem, saying, mm -hmm. you know, given what happened in the past, what's going to happen in the future. And also here, you could address this as a forecasting problem. Mm -hmm. What's the sun going to look like in an hour? Or as a, you know, masking reconstruction problem? Or maybe have some hybrid of the two and whatnot. And so one of the fascinating problems as an AI researcher coming to this is where to start. Now, there's so many things you can do. Yeah. There isn't that much previous work there. You get this like amazing empty, like, you know, blank canvas to work with. And you, but you also have like the pressure of the empty canvas. You have to make some choices, no? So in the end, we landed on this forecasting task, you know, because we figured this is not really a problem where masking is really relevant from the downstream tasks. You know, you typically have complete sensor data. It's not like something is missing, you know, reconstruction, not a typical problem there, but the dynamics is very complex and very interesting. So we structured this basically as a pretext task, you know, can we predict into the future, mm -hmm. you know? And, yeah. and so how does the model perform at predicting to the future compared to anything else that's been available? Okay, so there's a whole bunch of, of ways to unravel this, no? Um, there's a whole bunch of different tasks we evaluated the model on, you know? But actually what's more interesting is like, what we also do is we just like ran, because the model does basically tell you what it's gonna look like in the future. Mm -hmm. We just ran the model out near some solar flares and you know, lo and behold, you actually look at the model output and it generates the solar flare. And not just, you know, as a binary, yes, no thing, actually can see what the flare is gonna look like, you know, two hours from now, you see the spatial reconstruction, mm -hmm. et cetera, you know? Um, and this is something which did not, well, well, maybe careful, to our knowledge, did not exist before, you know, because typically this is like a binary as no task, but actually having a spatial, like a visual prediction of what a flare event looks like, you know, ahead of time is something novel. And I believe the team also worked on a, a benchmarking tool for this as well. Yep. Yeah. So this then goes back to the point we were saying earlier, you know, fine tuning and evaluating. So actually, we're not just releasing the model, you know, Soria. There's also Soria Bench, mm. which is, you know, primarily a data set, obviously, you know, basically that takes the SDO data together with other downstream data that was used, you know, for this whole evaluation, and obviously some sort of baseline scores, you know, mm -hmm. and this effectively defines a benchmark for, you know, a bunch of different events for this model. So is the goal then, I believe you're, you're going to open source both the model and, and the benchmark, is the goal then for potential, you know, researchers or scientists that, that would like to use this model to then use the benchmarking tool to say, I am. I have this application for that relates to you know heliophysics that's doing this well on that benchmark, and I've got one that's you know ranking this well to kind of create a heliophysics AI uh, little community. Yeah, I mean there is. I was to say there is a vast community already of heliophysics researchers, mm -hmm. and lots of the work there is AI research. No, it's not like AI has not been done by heliophysicists before. You know, so we have to be very careful there. You know, but I think. Um, what is definitely new here is the scale, you know, mm -hmm. the ambition between us and NASA, you know, the size of the data set, the size of the model, that's really something, you know, and we're, you know, very fortunate that we have the resources to work at this scale. Um, but then obviously the idea is that as someone, you know, interested in this field, you can obviously just take the model and run it. 
you know, and run the, you know, existing fine tuned models and its inferences, et cetera, and, you know, maybe build this into an application. Um, I'm saying maybe just because, you know, the threshold to adoption is really not, not our choice, you know, and this is like the choice of people who run these models. Obviously, you can tune the model further, mm -hmm. you know, you can take the benchmark and build, you know, a next model that, you know, eventually surpasses Soria, you know, and so all these possibilities exist from, you know, just running it, further tuning it, to just, you know, basically building an alternative, you know, all these things are possible. And obviously that's the one of research that you iterate further. You know? Totally. So what are some of the applications of the model that your team has been envisioning? So again, initially, primarily it's a research question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say this very clearly, you know, because the question of, you know, so this fundamental question, can you do a fully data driven model, mm -hmm. you know, at this stage? To address these tasks is one question. No, can you only learn on data? Mm. Uh, and we tried actually a bunch of things. It's interesting. So when we developed the model, we tried to inject some domain knowledge into the model. Mm. And actually, interesting, it turned out often to be better to let it train it from data. Huh. You know, that's a bit counterintuitive. You would say, hey, if I help the model a little bit by giving it some yeah. clues about what's going on, you would say maybe this helps. And often we said after ablating, they're like, no, 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 no. Let's just like let them figure it out from data. So that's one thing. Now, then the next point is. Um, Specific applications, mm -hmm. you know, where you say like, so let me rephrase this again. The first question was, can you do this in the first place? Mm -hmm. No. And if you do this for the first time, it's not clear. You know, it's like, yeah. yes, no question. It could have been, we said like, look, just by looking at the data from, at the model from, at the, I'm sorry, looking at the sun from one direction, not seeing the far side, you don't have enough information. The system is too complex. It doesn't work. It would be a possibility here, you know? So for, that's the first question. The next question, obviously, is then getting better performance, you know, in these various downstream tasks, you know, the flare prediction, whether visual or binary, you know? things like, you know, active regions, you know, other tasks involved. Um, and then there's finally the point of applications, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm saying that then because, as I said earlier, you know, um, basically solar flares, etc., would have or not would do heavily, you know, impact astronauts as soon as they leave, you know, mm -hmm. the protective layer of the Earth, you know, but adoption of protection of astronauts is a very high <laughs> threshold, you know, this is nothing we're going to drive from here, you know, eventually you would say, uh, ideally, this work or something that follows it, something that follows downstream in this research, mm -hmm. will help and support space exploration, will make space, space exploration safer. That would be fantastic. You know. Similarly, also say, um, you know, uh, protecting satellites, you know, control of satellites would also be helped. Eventually, would also be a fantastic application. You know. Finally, as we said, you know, there is cases where solar storms, you know, influence, you know, precision electronics on Earth. And again, so there's a space where the forecast. And using a better space with a forecast of these things would be good, you know. Um, but this really depends on the community adoption, et cetera, you know. So that's one has to be careful there. But we think we would like to envision these use cases, yes. I see. That's super interesting. So were there any surprises along the way while you were building the model? Yeah, there was a whole bunch of them. So as I said earlier, um, again, we tried at various times to infuse the model with sort of specific physics domain knowledge. Now, one has to maybe say first that, you know, we're very lucky we're working on this. You know, this is not just working from an AI point of view. We are working in collaboration with various domain experts, you know, heliophysics researchers, et cetera. And you got this very nice, it's nice to work interdisciplinary. You know, it's nice to work with experts who know their domain well and yeah. explain this well. And so I'm going to be on a tangent here, but it's, I think, important to point this out. This is not just an AI problem. Um, but so you try to infuse domain knowledge into this because mm -hmm. in principle, you'd say it helps. Let me give you one example now. So I said, one thing we said repeatedly is, you know, that SDO, you know, and does the model sees the sun only from, from one side, no? Which has several consequences. But one further aspect about the sun is the sun actually rotates, okay? Mm -hmm. And the sun rotates, you know, technically speaking, it rotates at different speeds at different latitudes, etc. That's not so relevant. But for us, actually, the rotation is not the most interesting thing, mm -hmm. you know? That's sort of like the first, the biggest effect that this rotation happens, no? But you're interested in is more like the stuff that is sort of the sub-leading effects, mm -hmm. you know, what then happens while it is rotating. Mm -hmm. So you would say like, oh, maybe if I tell the model that the sun is rotating, because it's always in the same direction, you know, I mean, it's a slightly different speed, it's a complex, but you know, maybe this will help the model, okay? Mm -hmm. um, or vice versa, we also say when you benchmark your model predicting in the future, you better benchmark a model that just moves the, beat a model that moves the pixels just to the right, you know? So you sort of play in this space, A, from figuring out that if you cannot even beat the rotation, you're definitely doing something wrong. But the second question is like, how do you actually, should you tell them all about the rotation? And we tried this in different ways. You know, we first, we trained like really, really like small, simple lightweight models that just capture the rotation, mm -hmm. you know? And then we sort of tried to train a correction term to this. Similarly, we actually also like encoded the rotation exactly, mm -hmm. you know? There's 
known equations for this, you know, which we coded up. And you would have thought that that would help. You know, you give the model some hints, you know, say like, look, you don't have to focus on this part because this is sort of, you know, the obvious things. And it turned out this was better actually turn these things off again. No? Yeah. And this is a bit counterintuitive because you see this again in some other domains, um, again, in scientific domains, have you seen this again? I mean, this is ongoing research pro and for, you know, but in weather, there is cases where people, for example, don't let the model predict the future, but only the difference from, 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 from the current, mm -hmm. okay? And this sort of way to tell the model, the future is gonna be similar to the present. You know, that's what happens in weather a lot. Um, so here, we tried these things, you know, and this sort of was one of many various surprises, you know, that it was better really just to run with a purely data-driven approach in the end, no? What did you find more difficult, and, and maybe it's not as comparable, but if you think about the work your team's done on, on uh, the Earth and our climate modeling versus the sun, is, is it a simpler problem because you're just looking at some gases moving in a, around an orb versus all of the different factors going on in Earth? Or is it because it's such a massive scale that it's, mm. it's more difficult? It's just a different problem. I think the, um, I mean, I see what you're getting at, but it's sort of, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you try to solve as many problems as you can. You know, if something, sometimes you're lucky and things fall into place quickly, you know, or maybe because you just, you don't really good work or some, but for reason, some, when things fall into, well, when things fall into place quickly, well, you're just going to do more. Yeah. You know, so in some sense, in the end of the day, you solve problems and the problems there can be research problems, you know, whether something is the right or AI problems or something is the right approach or not. There can be problems more in the domains and is this even possible or not to do this? You know, there's limits of what is sensibly possible and sometimes it's not clear and you're trying to push against some boundaries, but there can also be engineering problems, mm -hmm. you know, just where you scale something up, data doesn't flow fast enough. Yeah. And this is also, you know, these sort of scales, all these things sort of confluence together, you know, and you're just solving problems one at a time and you make progress. No? Yeah. So what's next for the team? That's an excellent question. So uh, obviously, you know, we're very excited to release the model, you know, then with that, the journey is obviously not over. You know, we're touching earlier on use cases. No, I don't think we're gonna drive like use cases all the way to the end ourselves, you know, for all sorts of organizational reasons. Obviously you wanna help adoption, mm -hmm. you know? This means we're not just open sourcing the model. There is also the benchmark, but then there's also that the model is integrated in what's called TerraTorch, you know, uh, yeah. which is our basically software stack to, you know, helping the fine tuning and use of foundation models, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, this is all going to be initially documented, you know, with, sorry, released with documentation, mm -hmm. etc. But, you know, there's always after release a bit more you can do, you know, so there's definitely like post-release handholding, mm -hmm. you know, then there's also the questions of, you know, further scientific evaluation. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have to see, you know, I think um, there is... Uh, the question what to continue in the case of helium physics. You know, this model is deterministic. You know, we did play a bit with probabilistic models. Mm -hmm. There's a question whether it makes sense to, you know, do that now immediately as well or mm -hmm. do that at a later time. But then there's also questions of other domains. You know, as I said, our work in general focuses on, you know, AI foundation models for science. So obviously, you know, there's other games one can play. There's a lot of stars in this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for making time today. I really appreciate this. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for having me. And if you want to know more, check us out on Hugging Face, where the models are, or our blog. Thanks, everyone.